order for us to start talking about how to deal with rejection, we first need to understand rejection is a part of life. Preston, I I break and sever that word curse, that spell spoken of. Listen, we live in a fallen world with hurting humans. We're going to experience rejection and I'm gonna show it to you in scripture. And let me go one step further. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are guaranteed to experience rejection. And Jesus said so. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Leader's Cut. What's going on? I feel like I haven't seen you in a week. Some of you, I've seen you maybe a couple of times this week. Uh, But on my end, I feel like I haven't gotten to see you. So what's going on? If it's your first time to uh, jump into this conversation, welcome. Jump into the comments. Let us know where you're from. Uh, There's a really awesome, welcoming community that uh, is comprised by All that, what are we going to, the cutters? I I don't even know if that's like culturally appropriate, but we we are a people of the cut. Followers of Jesus, we're meant to be. So I have mad respect for every person who's already watching this episode, especially, and I want you to hear this, if you are battling or have especially battled for a really long time, a root of rejection and a spirit of rejection. I want you to know I love you so much. And a hundred percent, this episode is for you. I believe this is a message from the Lord to you. And of course, I want everybody to make it to the end of the episode. But if you are battling a root of rejection, I am begging you to make it to the last minutes of this episode, because I think there might be a holy moment between you and the Lord. Uh, throughout this episode, but especially at the end, I believe there's going to be a releasing, uh, a freeing from this root of rejection. All right. So let's pray and we'll jump in to the cuts. Spirit of the living God, you are amazing. Father God, you, you alone are the greatest receiver mankind will ever know. You so badly wanted to receive us intimately into your presence and into eternal relationship with you that you sent your son to die on a cross for us in our place so that we could be received forever. Sin created rejection. There was no such thing among humans until there was sin. Your desire was not that we be rejected. Your desire was that we would be received. And yet we live in a fallen world filled with hurts and therefore filled with rejection. So Holy Spirit, would you so tangibly step into this conversation and wherever they are watching this, no matter what time of day, especially those who have a deep root of rejection. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray. I pray for an early birthday present. I pray that you would tangibly encounter them and that you would set the captive free. We expose our hearts to you, Holy Spirit, especially the hurts. As a part of your healing work, we know surgery will be required. So we yield ourselves to you, O God. Cut on us wherever it's needed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. I could have I could have just spent a good amount of time praying. I, I love to pray and I love you. And so when I put those two things together, sometimes I just want to kind of linger in it. <laughs> so my bad if that went a little bit too long. All right, let's make sure that we're on the same page as it relates to seeing rejection before we walk into uh, the, the steps we're going to take and the points we're going to cover. All right. 
The word, our English word rejection comes from the Latin word, a Latin word, which means to be thrown back. And to me, there are two things that are evident in this word rejection. Uh, it is someone who casts you aside. So rejection uh, involves being thrown aside, but also thrown back. And here's the way I see it. When we're dealing with a root of rejection, when someone rejects us today in our present, it's like it throws us back to the very first time a wound from rejection was created that first caused a root of rejection. So we are going to cover a lot of ground. And the first thing we're going to talk about, because some of us, you, you're, you might just be in the habit of tuning in every week. And if so, awesome. I love you. Thanks for the support. Um, but you might think, well, I, I don't really deal with a root of rejection. Well, let's walk through how a person knows if rejection is something that they're struggling with. Uh, and remember, there's the act of being rejected, but then there is the root of rejection. And a root of rejection is an undercurrent uh, from an initial rejection that causes more rejection. All right. So let's talk about uh, the evidences of rejection. First thing, rejection has obvious symptoms. Let me give them to you. First, and this is not a comprehensive list, nor is it in any kind of order, but the first um, couple on this list deal with relationships, and then the last couple deal with you personally. All right, so you relationally and you personally. First, uh, the first symptom of rejection is you relationally isolate. Isolation is a preemptive form of rejecting being rejected. It's literally like pulling, put, putting up a wall that people can't get around and you do it because you convince yourself that it's safer to live that way. You, you just isolate. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go through each of these and, and kind of minister to you in these. I'm pr simply presenting these to you as symptoms so that you uh, can take our conversation on rejection as seriously as you need to based on the number of symptoms you exhibit. All right. Uh, but I'm not ministering. I'm not giving you scriptures um, for these. Just trying to get you to see it. All right. The thought behind relational isolation is this. No one can reject me if I'm never around people long enough for them to reject me. So we put up a wall and we keep people out. If we relationally isolate, it is a fact we deal with rejection. Because think about it. If, if you don't struggle with rejection, you never feel the need to keep your distance from people. Right? Here's the second evidence of rejection. You crave control. So this is the other side of the coin. So isolation, you just steer clear of people in any deep way. But the other side of the coin is, okay, you're around people, but you crave controlling people. See, a lot of people think that the need for control is a power issue. I actually don't believe that. I believe it's much deeper than that. I think when someone has a need for control, it's actually a rejection issue. That's been my experience. Oftentimes people who have a root of rejection go around controlling everyone. If the close relationships you have are relationships where you're in control, in my opinion, it's a fact. You struggle with a root of rejection. And here's the thought behind controlling everyone in our relationships. This is the thought behind it. No one will reject me if I never give them the opportunity or the power to do so. I'll just control them. Needing to be in control is evidence of a root of rejection. Here's the third thing. You emotionally bully. This isn't my opinion. 
All right. I, I've been around this rodeo long enough to know uh, emotional bullying is rejecting others before they can reject you. This is actually preemptive rejection. So not rejecting rejection. This is actually preemptive rejecting. I'm going to reject you before you reject me. This is kind of a power struggle. The thought behind this is, is something, in my opinion, like this. If anyone in this relationship is going to experience rejection, I refuse for it to be me. And so, it must be you. And so, they bully. And really, I think part of the reason that people who deal with the root of rejection uh, or who have it, and listen, if you have a root of rejection, it's simply because you haven't dealt with the root of rejection. And trust me, in this episode, we're going to deal with it. All right. But to me, someone who hasn't dealt with their root of rejection goes around emotionally bullying people. And it's really not about the people they're bullying. It's actually they're doing what they wish they could do or could have done to the person who rejected them the most or first. And this is one of the things I try and remember. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in this episode. But when someone's trying to emotionally bully me, I try to be sensitive to them. Now, I don't receive what they say or, you know, heap upon myself what they do, but I do try to be sensitive because their emotional, emotional bullying of me really doesn't have that much to do with me. It goes back to a wound and a root that was created out of that wound. All right. Here's the next thing. Uh, as we kind of uh, wrap up the, the uh, relational side of the symptoms of a root of rejection. Here's the last one. You surround yourself with rejected or wounded people. Rejection feels safest in a room filled with the rejected. The, it's the old adage, misery loves company. Yeah, so do the rejected. Th th there's just something about feeling safer in a room where everybody else has a wound of rejection. If I had a buck for every time I saw a leader draw a crowd around them, so a leader with a root of rejection draw a crowd around them of people who are walking in wounds of rejection. If, if I had a buck for every time I saw it, I'd be a wealthy man. It, this, it's a play, it's a ploy. Because they haven't dealt with their rejection like a magnet, they are attracting people who are wallowing in the wounds of rejection. One of the evidences of being stuck is being surrounded by people who choose to stay where you no longer want to be. So if you're in that crowd, if, if you're running with a group of rejected and wounded people, I know you don't want to stay there. You may not know how to get out of there, but I know you don't want to stay there. So what are you going to do about it? Stop reaching for the low-hanging fruit. Yes, for the wounded flesh, it will always be easier to remain connected to people who have been rejected and have not been healed from the wounds of rejection. All right. So if, if you, especially as a leader, if you are drawing crowds of people who are, are living, walking wounds of rejection, that says more about your wound of rejection than theirs. And what it says is, you don't just have a wound, you got a root. Leaders who attract rejected people and don't help them be healed from it are leaders who refuse to deal with traumas in their past, which involved being rejected by people they love or look up to. Now let's transition to some of the personal uh, symptoms of a root of rejection. You're constantly trying to prove yourself. If you're somebody that is always feeling a need to prove that you belong, 
to prove that you matter, to prove that you're something or someone, you got a root of rejection. And Preston, how, how can you make that statement? How do you know? It's pretty simple. Those who don't feel received constantly seek to prove why they shouldn't be rejected. This, for me, goes back to when I was in junior high. And listen, I used to deal with the root of rejection. You, you've heard me talk about it, maybe not call it that, but I most certainly did. When I was in junior high is when it started for me. Uh, I had grown up uh, going to Christian schools, and when I went to junior high, it was the first time I was in a public school uh, or even in a school where my dad wasn't a pastor uh, of the church over the school. And I experienced a ton of rejection. And, and to you, maybe some of my, my past moments of rejection don't seem like a big deal, but for the little boy, they were huge. And the rejection I experienced opened up a door where I tried to do a, a variety of things so that I would not be rejected. And one of the things that I struggled most with was trying to prove myself. So until probably I was 25, I hate to say it, 24 maybe until I was 24. Uh, so essentially from 12 to 24, try and wrap your mind around that for literally <laughs> all of the years I had lived from birth up to when I first felt rejected. I lived that many years before I actually felt the Lord free me from the root of rejection. It makes me sad. I feel sad for the little boy. And it's part of what causes me to feel sad for you. If, if you are right now feeling rejected, I, I've been begging the Lord to anoint me to come into your cul-de-sac and to lovingly grab you by the hand and say, hey, you got nothing to prove, kid. You got nothing to prove. But as long as you feel you have something to prove, it is connected to a root of rejection. When you get a revelation that you are received, starting with God, but then by the ones you, that, that love you, whom you love, once you get a revelation you are received, there is no proving. I have nothing to prove. Love doesn't demand that I prove myself. Love loves me because I am myself. But if you feel like you got something to prove, you got a root of rejection. I got a root of rejection as long as I'm trying to prove it, prove it, prove it. Here's the next thing. Remember, these are the, the personal symptoms uh, of a root of rejection. If you fear fail failure, it's a symptom of a root of rejection. Here's the thinking, all right? behind someone who fears failure. Nobody rejects a success, so I better never fail. Nobody rejects a success, so I better make sure I never do anything but succeed. I can never fail. That is not how someone who is received talks. Absolutely, I battled the fear of failure. I've talked about it many times before. Again, it was connected to my root of rejection. I felt rejected. And buddy, I could go down a list. I, I remember the first time a girl rejected me. I remember the first time a girl tricked me like she was going to date me and then in front of everybody embarrassed me by saying she would never date me. Like I can go down a list, and, and I actually think that's a healthy thing, okay? And we're going to talk about that later in the episode. Um, but one of my things, I dealt with the fear of failure. Because somewhere along the line, I believed the lie. Well, you're only rejected when you fail. Because no one would ever reject a success. Anybody can be rejected. Whether they failed or whether they're succeeding. Rejection isn't about success. But a fear of failure is convinced 
As long as I experience success, I will never experience rejection. Then here's the last thing, and I think this is the biggest one as we talk about the personal symptoms of a root of rejection if you hide yourself. And what I really mean is you hide your full self. If you hide parts of yourself, if you hide the, some of the best parts of yourself, and here's the thought behind this activity, this choice, well, the more of me I show, the more chances I give others to show they don't like what they see. Okay, if this is how you, you think and this is how you live, I just want you to, I love you so much. And let me just say, by, by throttling yourself back, by hiding some of the best parts of yourself, you are screwing the rest of us who love you from getting to experience more of you. But when we battle a root of rejection, we throttle ourselves. We, we hide ourselves. We do not show all of us. And part of it is just a, well... And, and I want to be really sensitive with this, but it's really a way of saying, I think I would be personally devastated. It's one thing if they reject me over something over here, but if I showed them this side of me, which I think is my best side of me, and they reject me anyways, I think it would personally devastate me and I'd never be able to recover from it. And so we never show anybody that side. And it's actually a ploy of the enemy to keep us from ever experiencing intimacy in our relationships. Listen to me. Remember, God's enemy walks in the opposite spirit of our God. God desires intimacy. So what does that mean? The enemy never wants us to experience intimacy. What's the opposite of intimacy? Rejection, dog. The opposite of intimate relationship is rejection. And, and we reject ourselves before anyone else can when we throttle ourselves back, when we don't allow them to experience the fullness of who we are. And it's simply because we're afraid they'll reject us even more. And so we only let them see a little bit of us. And people who think they know us have no idea who we actually are because we're so afraid that they'll reject us that we don't show them our best sides. Okay, this was to help, hopefully, uh, everybody kind of get on the same page and go, yeah, do I do I struggle with, with a root of rejection? Lord, do I have a root of rejection? So, some of us, every single one of these, we check the boxes. And listen, I checked every one of these boxes. If you're thinking, Preston, where did you get these? It's from living it out. I so battled a root of rejection earlier early on in my life that I've learned a lot as a result of it. All right. So let's get to the second part that this first part of the conversation, what does a root of rejection look like? What are its symptoms? Here's the second thing that I want us to talk about in order for us to start talking about how to deal with rejection. We first need to understand rejection is a part of life. Preston, I, I break and sever that word curse, that spell spoken of. I, listen, we live in a fallen world with hurting humans. We're going to experience rejection and I'm going to show it to you in scripture. And let me go one step further. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are guaranteed to experience rejection. And Jesus said so. But learning to deal with rejection begins with expecting to be rejected. Listen to what Jesus said in, in John 15, verses 18 and 19. He said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first, okay? Hates, rejects, rejects. Preston, if the world rejects you, remember, it rejected me first. That's John 1. What does John 1 say? Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. Verse 19, the world would love you as one of its own, Preston, if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, watch, 
So it's going to reject you. Jesus says rejection is a part of not only living in a fallen world, but being one of his followers. He was rejected. And I'm going to read you a passage about the, the nastiness of how we rejected him before we received him as our savior and Lord and friend is ugly. But Jesus says, listen, this is how it's going to be if you follow me. Now, some of you might think, well, that, that, that is not encouraging. That's negative. No, it's actually amazing. Let me try and, and paint the picture like this. Have you ever had someone, let, let's say, I don't get into this stuff. I don't think it's actually a good thing, but that's a whole other episode. Uh, let's say you go to like those really gory, gory, scary uh, haunted houses. Okay. I don't mean like going to Disney you know, and ride in the, the haunted mansion ride and it's silly, you know, I'm talking about full on dark, scary. Okay. I don't like that stuff. I actually don't think it's the Lord. I think it can open doors, but let's just say that, uh, you and a group of friends were going to one of those. And so everybody's kind of on edge cause we're about to be scared and we're waiting in the lobby, you know, to go into this haunted house and somebody comes up behind you, one of your friends, because they see you're kind of walking on eggshells and you're already scared and nothing's even happened. And one of your friends comes up behind you and shouts and grabs you and you freak out. Okay, that's one scenario. But what if in that same scenario, one thing changes? What if? As one of your friends is coming up from behind to scare you and take advantage of your fear, what if another one of your friends in front of you saw behind you and said, hey, Jill's coming up behind you and she's trying to scare you? What would that enable you to do? To go like this? Silly Jill. And you're not going to be scared. You're not going to be caught by surprise. Why? Because a friend told you what was coming. When a friend tells you what is coming, it is always easier to handle what comes. This is the approach Jesus is taking. Preston, I need you to expect to be rejected. I don't want to go too far down this road. This should probably be another episode, but I think one of the reasons that so many followers of Jesus don't actually seek to make other disciples and lead people to Jesus is because they're afraid of rejection. Because they haven't dealt with their own root of rejection, they're afraid of experiencing more of it. And if we're going to lead people to Jesus, we're going to experience rejection from time to time from people who do not yet know Jesus. That's why Jesus goes, hey, heads up. As you follow me, you're going to encounter rejection. Rejection is a part of life. But he, he's also, I believe, making an even stronger statement. I think he's teaching us. That as followers of Jesus, if we aren't experiencing rejection, we can't say we're on the path he laid out. This is how comfortable you need, I need to get to get with rejection. All right. I'm just talking about leading people to Jesus. I'm talking about, let's say you're an artist. Hey, not everything you create is going to, re to be received well. Let's put it on me. Not every sermon I preach, not every reel that goes out is going to be received well. I get rejected all the time. What I'm saying gets rejected all the time, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. If I'm not expecting to be rejected, then when I am rejected, I'm going to be even more overwhelmed. I literally said to my wife, laying in bed this morning together, I said, babe, I honestly think the Lord is completely behind the speed by which everything is growing outside, kind of in the, the social media or online world uh, for me. And she said, why? And I said, because it's a process. And I said, I'm learning that the more influence God gives me, the more comfortable I'm going to have to get with people arguing over what I'm saying, especially with me. And not taking that as rejection, because it isn't. 
And they might mean for it to be, but it's not. I love the conversation. It doesn't bother me. I have a perspective. I have a perspective of scripture. Am I always right? Certainly not. And anyone who says they're always right is proving they're not. If we aren't experiencing rejection as followers of Jesus, I don't think we can make the case that we are walking on the path he laid out for us. Because in Isaiah 53, scripture actually gives us a description of Jesus' rejection. And it's talking about us, how we rejected him. Let me read it to you. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1, 2, and 3. And to whom was the arm of the Lord, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root cut out from a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. This is, this is speaking of Jesus. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as from one whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. If you are battling intense rejection, I want you just to get this clear picture. If you're a follower of Jesus, the one you follow understands rejection even more than you do. Just wrap your mind around that. Try. It's one thing when we're five years old and we, you know, color something in kindergarten and someone makes fun of it and rejects us. It's another thing to leave the right hand of the father. Laying aside all of your divine privileges. Not having to do any of it. But willingly. Choosing to lay your life down to the point of death. And the very people you came to die for are mocking you. making fun of you while you hang on the cross. That's a measure of rejection you and I will never be able to understand. Our stuff is, is on the playground. His stuff is on the cross. And I'm not minimizing what we've been through. I am simply trying to paint a picture Jesus isn't, isn't putting rejection upon you. He's trying to help you understand. This is the way. And I'm going to help you understand why in this next point. All right. How do I deal with rejection? So Preston, if rejection is a part of living in a fallen world, how do I deal with it? How do I learn to navigate it without it taking me out? Well, I'm going to give you three things to pray about uh, becoming part of the way that you personally deal with rejection when people reject you. Here's the first thing. Be received. The fastest way to deal with being rejected is to be received. And I don't mean by the person who rejected you. I'm, I'm going well beyond them. I'm going to the Lord. I want to be really, really, really careful with what I'm about to say. But I felt like the Lord gave me a picture when I was preparing for this. Um, and I want to be so, so delicate and sensitive with this 
But I felt like the Lord gave me a picture of somebody who is watching this right now. Whose birth parents gave them up for adoption. And the enemy has been wreaking havoc using a root of rejection, creating a narrative that you are unlovable and that no one will ever receive you the way you desire to be received because your parents rejected you and they were the first ones who had a chance to and therefore everyone else will too. All of it is a lie from the enemy, but I, I am not minimizing what you're feeling. But I want to read a verse to you that I felt like the Lord gave me to give to you. And it got me when he gave it to me. Uh, but I just want to read it to you. Psalm 27 verse 10. Even if my father and mother abandoned me. The Lord will hold me close. Oh, I'm not crying for me. I'm crying for you because I felt it so strongly with the Lord earlier. And I, I, with all my heart, believe the Lord wants to minister to you. And, and I want you to get a picture of what being received by the Lord looks like. Okay. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14, 15, and 16, I believe paint a wonderful picture. Now, I know this is talking about Israel, but remember, as believers in Jesus, as Gentiles, we've been grafted into the family of God. So this is a principle that we must understand about how God loves and how God draws us close, especially when, not just even when, but especially when we are being rejected by others. Let me read it to you. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Listen to God's response, because if, if you are under a lie, my parents rejected me or someone I love. My spouse rejected me. That, that was the other half of the coin. Someone who is walking through a divorce right now, not by your choosing. Someone you have loved since you were young is rejecting you. And it is painfully just wreaking havoc. The enemy is, is like a wrecking ball using it and trying to drive home. The person you love most is rejecting you. God's rejecting you too. And I want to show you how God responds when the enemy tries to bring these accusations of rejection against us, trying to create a root of rejection. Listen to how God talks. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. He's saying Preston's, hum hu Preston humans will get it wrong. It's not my desire, but unfortunately, from time to time, a mother will give up her nursing child. Surely they may forget, but watch what he says about himself. Yet I will not forget you. And then he says, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and see if the inscription are the nails. The piercings of the nails that he took for me. I wonder if that's the tattoo he's talking about. Put both of these passages together. Even if my mother and father abandoned me, the Lord will bring me close. And, and what does the hand of God, which brings me close, look like? The nail pierced hands of the son of the living God. If you're going to deal with the root of rejection and, and not experiencing it ever again, 
every time you are rejected. If you're going to be able to successfully deal with being rejected, it starts with being received. To me, Jesus was the most receiving human who ever walked the face of the earth because he understood how received he was and is by the Father. And he understood it beyond any, anything any human who will ever live understands their reception from God the Father. Jesus knew better than anyone how received he was and is by the Father. This is essential. Yes, in this life, we're going to deal with rejection. But man, I, I'm I, the, the hits I take online of people trying to, to start something with me and, and take a jab at me, it's okay. And you want to know why? Because no amount of rejection you are ever going to be able to throw my way will ever overwhelm the measure of reception I experience as a son of the living God. I am received. And so even if you reject me, I know my God will always receive me. He will always draw me close. And the hand he uses to draw me near is the hand which was pierced by the nails for me. If you're going to deal with rejection, and we are, we got to start with being received. That, that is, the and, and next week's episode, when we talk uh, about dealing with criticism, all right? So I wanted to cover, you know, this, a root of rejection, before we get to learning how to grow from receiving criticism. Listen, being received, understanding how received you are by the Father is essential to navigating rejection in a fallen world. And here's the next thing, and these two things are gonna be hard because if you're presently dealing with the root of rejection, you're not gonna like these two things, but you gotta hear it, okay? Not only can must you be received to deal with rejection, you also must be forgiving. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Why must we forgive those who reject us? Let me give you a personal why, uh, more than a spiritual why. Because you'll never be released from rejection until you first, first release the rejector. I, I, I see this time and time again with past traumas that people have experienced until you release the person who rejected you. You cannot be released from a root of rejection. It will continue to lay a hold on you. So you have to release them. Listen, forgiving someone isn't agreeing with them. Forgiving someone is not agreeing with them. And it, it is not endorsing what they did. Um, it is simply saying, I'm not going to hold on to that moment by holding you captive and connecting it to what you did to me and rejecting me. I forgive you. And I am releasing you from what you did to me. And as I release you from what you did to me, I am actually giving the Lord the room, the access to my heart so that I can be released from the root of rejection that that rejection caused. So we forgive them. And I'm going to give you a picture of what that looks like. And I think Joseph is the best picture. And this is the third thing. I'm only giving you three things because these are heavy things. All right. It takes work to get a revelation of being received and living in it. And then it takes a lot of work to forgive people who have rejected us, especially the ones we love the most, 
who said something or did something that hurt us more than anything else. Here's the third thing. If we're going to deal with rejection in a way where it doesn't take hold, it doesn't take root in our hearts, we have to be caring. Not just forgiving, caring. Genesis 50, remember the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery, uh, pretended he was dead. And Joseph goes on to become the second most powerful person nearly on the planet at the time. And his father dies. And once Jacob is dead, Joseph's brothers start freaking out and saying, well, now that our father is dead, Joseph is, is he's going to kill us. And so they come to, to Joseph and they say, hey, before our father died, he told us to tell you to forgive us. And it, it kind of is a laughable situation in a way in which they walk it out. But I want to read to you how Joseph responds to his brothers. And listen, you talk about rejection. Joseph's brothers rejected him by throwing him in a pit and then selling him into slavery. They so rejected him from their family that they sold him as a common slave. Listen to how he responds to his brothers. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me when you rejected me. But God intended it all for my good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. Watch what he says. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Think about this. Why did Joseph's brothers reject him? I personally believe Joseph's brothers rejected him because they felt rejected by their own father. Remember the coat? Joseph was so beloved by his father in a way he didn't love his other sons. And that's on him. Okay, so he def Jacob definitely created this problem. But Joseph's brothers rejected him because of their own rejection issues. People who feel rejected reject people when they feel rejected. And so Joseph's brothers sold them into slavery. Rejection is a cycle. And until someone breaks it, all everybody in the circle is going to experience will be rejection. Someone has to break the cycle of rejection. And here's how you do it. Caring for people in love breaks the cycle of rejecting with hate. Jacob's brothers hated him. And I, here's how I would say it. To the extent they did not feel loved by their father is the extent to which they hated their beloved brother. Here's what's awesome. Because remember, th this, this was in the family. Jacob and Esau. Joseph's father. He had, he had navigated this with his own brother. What did, what did he do? He felt he was rejected. What did he do? He faked a bunch of stuff. He lied to be received in order to receive the blessing of the firstborn. So he stole from his twin. It's a cycle. Rejection is a cycle. And the only way to stop a cycle of rejection is to care for people in love. This is what Joseph did. Preston, I don't want to care for these people. Okay. And I love you, but we only talk like that. 
when we're still hurting. That's evidence the wound is still very raw. I'm not saying you're bad. I'm just trying to lovingly submit to you where you're at because I love you too much to leave you in that wound. I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you that being a Christ follower is easy. It is impossible. Being a follower of Christ is impossible because I know some of you who are feeling rejection now from certain people and you're hearing about Joseph caring and love for the people that rejected him and sold him into slavery and you're going, how in the world am I supposed to do this? That's impossible, Preston. There's an answer. Christ living in you. You can't do it in your flesh because your flesh is where the wound of rejection was first experienced. So the flesh is raw. The flesh is protective of a hurting heart. You can't do this in your natural strength. Only by Christ living in you. Well, Preston, I don't, I don't know if I, if I can sign up for that. Man, that, that's too hard. Okay, then stay where you are. Stay her. Wall her in rejection and keep rejecting everybody you love because your fear of being rejected is so gripping that year by year, you're just pushing everybody who loves you further and further away. And that brings us to the last part. Uh, These last two points are questions because I really do want to give you answers. If you are, if, if you've experienced a root of rejection and it's not been dealt with, here's the big question. How do I heal from rejection? We're going to be really, really careful and we're wrapping up our time together. But we're just going to kind of slowly move through this part. And here's what I'd ask. If you've experienced a root of rejection, but the Lord has freed you from it, uh, don't, please don't act as though this part of the episode isn't for you. What I'm going to ask of you, and it's going to sound maybe crazy, let it keep playing. And while this part of the episode is praying, I'd ask you who have been healed of and freed from a root of rejection, I'd ask you to pray for your brothers and sisters. Just during this time, just pray. Because I believe the Holy Spirit's going to do some very powerful work in this part of this episode. I believe some people are going to be healed in some very deep places from wounds of rejection. Here's the first thing. If, if we're going to be healed from rejection, here's the first thing. We have to go back to the moment it sprouted. A root always starts with a sprout, a seed which finds soil and enough nutrient and enough water to sprout. When someone rejects us, the more we either love the person or look up to the person or want close relationship from the person, The extent to which we desire any of those things is the extent to which the seed sprouts. And sometimes that root gets big fast. But we have to go back to the moment it sprouted. I want you to think about something. Do you remember the the time in Moses' life after he leaves the palace? So he'd spent 40 years growing up in Pharaoh's palace. Do you remember when he killed an Egyptian? I've always wondered. I wonder if that's connected to a root of rejection from his childhood. I wonder if there was a moment where the prince of Egypt, who might have even been near the same age, same season of life as Moses, I wonder if the prince ever picked on Moses. I wonder if he was ever mocked for being an Israelite. 
for not being like everybody else in the palace. And I wonder if as a young boy, a root of rejection took hold, sprouted and took hold in such a deep way and in such a deep place. And because Moses never dealt with it, I wonder if that day when he saw someone like him being picked on and abused and hurt by someone like his rejector and abuser, I wonder if that's why he snapped. I wonder if that's why he raged. My experience, rage is usually connected to rejection. And Moses raged that day, cost a man his life. I wonder if he just would have gone back to the moment. I know it takes courage. And I don't know what your moment is. Maybe life was amazing until that one day your spouse came into the room and you thought you were about to go on a date and they told you, I don't love you anymore. And like a flood, rejection came in and took root in your heart and in your life. And maybe it was a couple years ago, but the pain still feels like it was a couple of seconds ago. Typically, that's the case when we haven't gone back to that place to fully deal with what happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very, very sensitive, okay? But let's move on because I don't want to linger here in the moment because some of you, you're, you're doing it. You're, you've gone back to that moment and you're sitting there with your eyes closed and you see the moment, the little girl was rejected, where it all started. You see the moment that the young woman was rejected by the one she loved the most and thought she would live with forever. You see where the little boy wasn't chosen or was mocked on the playground or was given up for adoption. In order to be healed by rejection, we have to go back to the moment. But listen, we don't just sit in the moment. Let me tell you what we do next. We invite Jesus into the moment. If, if you're in this with me and you're going back to that moment in your life, I want you just in your heart, if you were five years old, if you were 50 years old, whatever piece of dirt on this earth you were standing or sitting upon, go back to that moment. And then I want you to see the five-year-old you, the 50-year-old you, welcome Jesus into the rejection. As someone you love, as someone you look up to, as someone you want to be in a relationship with rejects you. I want you not just to receive Jesus, to invite Jesus into the rejection. And you might be thinking, Preston, what? If, if Jesus were there and he loves me, why didn't he do anything? Oh, he was doing something. We're just not always aware of what he's doing. Well, what was he doing? Let me give you a picture of what he was doing. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. and They will never perish. Watch this. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one 
can snatch them from the Father's hand. Okay, don't just apply this to salvation. Apply this to our eternal relationship. Salvation at its core involves eternal fellowship with God. And this is what Jesus says. Here's how received you are. When I hold on to you, no one using their rejection can rip you out of my hand. No one. I am holding on to you. What was Jesus doing in that moment? He was speaking words, not just of affirmation, but of reception. You are mine. You belong to me and no one. They might be throwing you away. Remember the Latin word to be thrown aside or thrown back. Jesus says they might be trying to throw you away. I will never throw you. I will never let you out of my hand. I am holding on to you. I am your protector. I am your refuge. I'm the one who loves you more than anyone ever will. I am the one who sticks closer than the brother who's rejecting you. And when we invite Jesus into our rejection, he reminds us, they did it to me too. I know what you're feeling. The very ones I came to show my love to are the ones who rejected me at the foot of the cross where I showed my love. And Jesus is present in the moment, in our hearts. And that leads to the third thing. The way we are healed of rejection is we live in the love of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. This is a prayer. The prayer is that you, this is my prayer for you, that you, being rooted. I remember what we've been talking about this whole episode is a root of rejection. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, how do you get free from a root of rejection? You root yourself in love. I pray that being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be able to comprehend with all of the children of God, all the saints, what is the width and length, and depth, and height to know the love of Christ. How deep, how wide, how high, how long. The love of Christ which passes knowledge. It is immeasurable and not able to be comprehended with finite minds that you may be filled with the fullness, all the fullness of God. Hear me. God receives what man rejects. And you can walk in real time through rejection without being wounded by it so long as you live in the love of Christ. The love of man is limited. The love of Jesus is eternally immeasurable. Psalm 94, verse 14, the Lord will not reject his people. He will not abandon his special possession. And he's not just talking about Israel. He's talking about you. As we wrap up our time together, before I pray, for those of you who have navigated rejection, um, and God is is doing a healing work in your heart. I just want to remind you, because I've told you, Jesus was rejected, but I want to show you, because maybe up to this point, the enemy has gotten you to believe the lie that 
because you've been rejected, you'll always be rejected. And it is game, set, and match. That's it. Case closed. It's over. Let me read you a verse in Psalm 18, verse 22, uh, about our stone, uh, Jesus, the stone which the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. Just like Joseph, God took the rejection the people Joseph loved most heaped upon him and used it for Joseph's good, for Joseph's brother's good, and for the Lord's good. Don't be surprised if, just like Joseph, God takes the rejection you've experienced and turns it into a wrecking ball for the kingdom of God. You might have been rejected by people, but God will not reject you. I want to pray over you, and especially those uh, for whom this episode is for, and if, if there's some deep stuff going on, hit me up, reach out in the DMs, shoot me an email, um, jump in the comments, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Um, I know this is a process, but I also know this is a turning point. I believe if you have been battling a root of rejection, as we wrap up our time together today, that the spirit of the Lord is freeing you if you will let go of all the fear attached to the rejection, of all the frustration attached to the, to the rejection, of all of the hate attached to the rejection, of all of your fleshly responses to the rejection. If you will let go and loosen your hold on all of those things in the flesh, with all of my heart, I know where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and He is going to set those who have been captive free. Let me pray over you. God, I love my brothers and sisters so stinking much. I love them, I love them, but you love them immeasurably more than I do. And God, for those who, who have experienced rejection and, and have been wallowing in the wounds of rejection and and being overwhelmed and overcome and, and bound by a root of rejection, Spirit of the living God, I pray you would set the captive free. Would you release them from the chains that have bind, been binding them? I pray you would heal their hearts. May you deal with every hurt. And Lord, I pray you would shut up the voice of the enemy in Jesus' name. Who's been trying to speak a, a lie, a demonic narrative over my brothers and sisters, the ones you love so much. I pray you would shut the lies of the enemy up in Jesus' name. That you would not allow one lie to land. May they get a revelation of how received they are by you. They can therefore now come boldly into your presence, O God, anytime they want. They are that received. Lord, I can't heal them with my words. But you can heal them however you want. God, would you heal them? And would you close this door that rejection opened up, which the enemy has been running in and out of for years and years to bring darkness, fear, and hate? God, would you shut the door? And would you heal the heart behind the door? And would you
would you divinely enable them to forgive those who have rejected them and hurt them and to even in whatever way possible care for them in love God as we release those who have rejected us we know you are releasing us from the chains of rejection may we now go forward living like Jesus being so confident of how we are received by God through Christ that we become some of the most receiving people especially with those who reject us let that be the strongest evidence to your enemy O God that he will never ever get away with the root of rejection in our hearts ever again we will receive those who reject us Lord bless my brothers and sisters render him speechless by what they see you do next bless them Lord show them the way in which they are to go and anoint them for the steps ahead in Jesus name amen 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 I love you seriously so much and if the Holy Spirit started doing a work and there's it, it, there's just a lot of pain and I totally get it and you you want to reach out reach out we're family and in whatever way the Lord desires to use me in this season of your life uh, in this part of the journey of your life as a Christ follower I'm here for it and uh, I want him to be pleased so uh, if you need to reach out reach out jump in the comments uh, in the comments you're not just going to hear from me you're going to hear from a lot of people uh, for those of you who who are cutters man get in the comments and and make sure that anybody who opens up and is transparent and vulnerable enough and courageous enough to say hey i'm dealing with with rejection my heart is, is aching my heart is broken uh, let's love on them let's overwhelm them all right and if you need to reach out privately uh, i'm opening the door for you to do so all right i love you so much and i'm so proud of you those of you who just did some seriously heavy lifting and allowed the god of the universe to do some pretty serious cutting i love you so much i am so proud of you i am praying for you i'll see you next week thanks for joining me for this episode of the leader's cut i pray you sense god speak directly to you through it before you leave Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new episode is posted. And be sure to share your takeaways and favorite one-liners in the comments. And if you think it could help a friend or two, I'd love it if you would send them the link to share it with them. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.